Okay, everybody, I hope you had fantastic conversations amongst each other. This is Conversation Peace. My name is Ashley Peacock, and it's my absolute honor to host this evening. So a little bit about Conversation Peace. What you just did is the beginning of the work that we want to accomplish with this event series. You connected with other human beings in a positive discourse. So the mission of Conversation Peace is to recruit creatives in reshaping the problem-solving dynamic. And here in Flint, we're just asking ourselves to find our role in creating a new Flint. As I mentioned at last month's event, the inspiration for this event series between, between Nick and I and our discussions was what we saw in Flint is this approach to solving problems that was inherently negative. It was born of complaints. We just want to fix things that are broken. And I thought, we can, we can do better. We can do better than just filling up a hole. We can make a sandcastle. We can do better than just returning ourselves to some imaginary baseline where everything is okay. We can create something new. And the reason that we're targeting creatives is because creatives work in the medium of the unseen. We find things that don't exist yet and then make them real. And I truly believe that in our discourse and reshaping our communities, that's what needs to happen. So we're tapping creatives to lead the way. Now, I'd like to speak a little bit about our guest this evening, Gordon Pennington. We have become fast friends, and we already have plans to eat fried chicken together. So, Now, Gordon is managing director of Burning Media Group. He's a cultural commentator, lecturer, consultant, and advisor to organizations, corporations, governments around the world. He's been described by the Wall Street Journal as a high-tech traveler in low-tech countries. After developing award-winning marketing communications for Citicorp and serving as a consultant to both Chase Manhattan Bank and J.P. Morgan Bank, he turned to fast-growth consumer product markets, serving as director of marketing for Tommy Hilfiger. Who's wearing Tommy tonight? Oh, oh, points, points docked, points docked. He's also managed marketing and strategy assignments and been advisor to Apple Computer, British Airways, the CBS television network, the Coca-Cola Company, Equinox Fitness, the Oxford Analytica, Mayado Investment Bank of London, and Her Majesty's Ministry of Defense in the UK. A varied and impressive list of accomplishments, but this is what really grabbed me about his bio. This is what got my attention. Beyond critical analysis, his work is focused on the creation of effective strategies and the development of brand value. And if the media is the message, as Marshall McLuhan asserts, Pennington seeks to better understand messaging and assist clients in making their communications more effective. He's in the business of knowing and being known, of seeking to understand and creating positive dialogue. This is the guy for this work. Now, everything I needed to know about Gordon wasn't in his bio. It was in our trip home from the airport. I picked Gordon up from the airport yesterday and we immediately fell head over heels in love with one another. We had a fantastic conversation in the car, but we stopped at Barnes & Noble on the way. Uh, in Flint, in Flint. And watching Gordon in Barnes & Noble was like watching a child in a museum. First, he insisted on buying me coffee, so that spoke to his massive generosity. And then I just, I watched him bounce around the store, going to the philosophy section, the Christian section, the art section, and this magnificent curiosity just radiated from him. And I wanted, I wanted to find out more about the gears that I saw turning. I said, Gordon, who are some of your favorite artists? And he, he had a list ready. 
On the tip of his tongue, he rattled off six artists and then went back to the art book section and grabbed a book of a 20th century sculptor and just gushed about the impact this sculptor had on our culture. Then I watched Gordon check out. The kindness with which he treated the cashier, the dialogue that he created, this man makes friends everywhere. And I'm not talking about acquaintances, I'm talking about friends. It, it, it's magnificent to watch because he knows people immediately and there's a depth of connection with somebody as, as tertiary as a, as a wait person or a cashier and they're fast friends. And I've never heard somebody talk about having dinner with celebrities with the amount of humility that Gordon radiates. So that balance between self-awareness, authoritative knowledge of culture and business, a passion for other people, wrapped in generosity and humility, I want this guy in my life and I want to learn from the way this guy learns. So ladies and gentlemen, Gordon Pennington. Hello, my friend. Gordon, welcome home. Thank you. I love Michigan. It's good to be back. So I immediately fell in love with the way you learn, with that, with that curiosity. And what I'm wondering is, in Bernie Media Group's current endeavors, or just in, in your travels and your, 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 your general um, uh, endeavors right now, what are you learning? And moreover, what are you excited about what you're learning? Uh, my mother and my grandmother and my father, a lot of my family members instilled in me along life's journey uh, what I hope is an insatiable curiosity. And as I go further in life, maybe you feel the same way, uh, I realize how little I know. And the longer I go, the larger the questions become, the more complex my understanding of things, are, and I feel like I know less and less and less. But my hunger in terms of data and experience and exposure to things feels opposite. You know, we've all, we're, we're just putting mileage on. <laughs> well, you know, some of us have more mileage in this room than others. All kinds of mileage, good and, good and bad. But along the way, you awaken to things and you learn things and you become more, as we said in our small group, self-aware. That doesn't necessarily mean narcissistic or selfish, but self, how do I come across? And then how we interact with people, emotional intelligence. Am I smart about, am I thoughtful about my interactions with people? And often I'm not because I'm headstrong, I get an idea, I can't be talked out of something that I should be more able to listen in humility to what others have to contribute. And sometimes that tenacity works for you and sometimes it doesn't. So for me, the thing I'm excited about most, if I had to land on one square, I would tell you that today, if we don't change education, Every other transformation of infrastructure, every problem we solve, everything we try to fix, everything we do in the financials, in, in socioeconomics and political cycles, isn't going to last. The, our biggest concern must be taking a good, hard look at education, what it produces, what its premise and promise is, and what is it we believe education will do in creating a citizen. The people we will live with, the people we will live amongst, who will influence us for better or for worse, are the product of our educational system. And it's not just one system, obviously. It's multiple systems of education, which has a lot to do with privilege and access and opportunity and resource. I get that. But education has to be, at some level, our primary consideration and concern as human beings who all, I, I would guess, whatever our background, we all want to see our kids have a better future, how we define that future, how fairly, how generously, how compassionately we find that has a lot to do with our, our experiences. But if I had to answer that question, uh, I think education keeps me up at night and has me the most concerned and the most passionately interested in what we can do better. And I'm really just at the beginning of a learning journey and I, I could talk about education the whole night. So in terms of reform, I think we could all come up with a list of ways we would like to see educational systems in this, in this country in particular be adjusted. 
what are some actual approaches that we can take, some, some practical approaches we can take? Is, is it legislation? Is it partnering with teachers? What are some things that we can do to affect change in our community's education? Well, look, the political system is the administration of the, of the, the collective will, even if we're a divided nation on politics. By the way, I just want to say, what a wonderful thing to have a conversation night like this. Thank you, Flint and Foster and all and Hub, all of you guys that are doing this tonight, because if there's one thing our country needs, it's a, an understanding of how to conduct a cordial and civilized conversation, even when we disagree or disagree deeply, we got to be able to hear each other. Even when, I got to understand the person that totally disagrees with me and have at least the modicum of respect to say that there's a reason they feel that way. They may or may not be rational persons, but you can't find that out unless you find out what have they lived through that's made them feel that way. So if you're gonna fix education, I think of course you gotta have great teachers. Of course you gotta respect the sacrifices teachers make in virtually every setting. My mother was a public school teacher in the Michigan public schools, and she set out, went to the University of Michigan as an undergrad, got her master's degree in curriculum development as an educator, and went to work in Owasso public schools for nearly 40 years. And she loved it with a passion. And she, on weekends and every chance she got, she was buying more things to teach for kindergarten and first grade. She landed in first grade because she wanted to see the incandescent excitement and joy of learning to read. That excited her more than anything. She was a lifelong reader and she would buy things on her own time and her own dime. She would go and bring curriculum resources, even, even phonetics containers so that you could, this is a horse and you know, every other phonetic. I mean, I can't remember. I think my mother even stole my plastic toys at times for her phonetics boxes. But she loved kids and loved education, and, and she made a sacrifice that she didn't really feel as a fact because the joy of her calling, her conviction, her commitment, her gifting in life was to see kids develop a lifelong. And I don't know how many people have seen this, but long after my mother retired, when I'd come back to Michigan from New York City where I was living, and to visit her, people would ring the doorbell on occasion and say, is Mrs. Pennington still there? Because she lived in the same house near the same school where she'd walk a block away. Is Mrs. Pennington still here? She's still alive. And indeed, they'd say, Mrs. Pennington, of all my teachers, I remember, a first grade teacher, that's unusual. But she had that inspirational effect on people and me. So I'm, I'm grateful for educators. We're not gonna just legislate better education. If you want to get into that, I'd be happy to talk about what, what I think is, you know, we all have opinions on this, right? Every, anybody care about education? I guess some, uh, or those that are, care about it and not expressing it, uh, probably still feel a concern about it. But how do we fix education? How do we create accessible education for everybody? The public schools is our best chance for that. But, not, but public schools are underperforming for lots of reasons and not just the fault of teachers. Um, and other schools are not necessarily performed. I mean, this is a big, big question. It's a dilemma. We're going to argue about it because we all have different feelings. But we should be talking about it. We should be arguing about it in a wholesome and robust way because our kids are the beneficiaries or they're the ones that are going to suffer from our decisions. So, I want to get, I want to get micro for just a second on, on this topic. I, I love this topic and where it's going. So, you, for instance, you have an engaged parent who has a child coming home who's disheartened, who's being derailed in some way, maybe it's a teacher, maybe it's what they're being forced to learn. How do you address this? What conversations and in what ways do you have the conversations to address the substantial amount of time that your child is exposed to something that might be derailing them from, from what you would like to see them experience in their life? Right, well look, uh... <laughs> You're going to put your kids through K-12 for 16,000 hours. 16,000 hours. That's a lot of influence. And if that influence isn't matched or if that influence isn't balanced somehow, if that influence isn't measured or, or, or challenged somehow at home, there's a deficit already because it's hard enough to get, absorb everything you need to absorb in a school environment. It's even harder when there's dysfunction or failure or struggle or, 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 or hunger or poverty at home. It's not easy. And then, then you have people who have affluence and, and, and opportunity and sometimes they don't get enough love and attention from parents who are very successful but very busy. I've, I've, I've seen the whole spectrum. 
I've seen people that are lonely in every circumstance in life. So I, pro I think that's part of the human situation. But I think you're right. Uh, education really is going to be fomented and, and, and nurtured by good parenting. But I, I came from a broken home. And I was the only kid in my class. This is, you know, I mean, I you know, graduated in the 1970s. When I was in Owasso, Michigan, my hometown, I was the only kid I knew from a divorced family. Can you imagine that today? This is a town of like 25, 30,000 people in Owasso. And I felt like a social misfit, a pariah. I just felt like, gosh, you know, I'm the only kid without a father here. I'm, I actually knew three other kids who did not have fathers because, uh, because their fathers had, had passed away. But I, as a result of divorce and dysfunction, I just felt socially misplaced. And that's a hard thing to deal with. So you're self, you're self conscious, which doesn't help. But, but my mother, you know, she did so many things to go beyond what was, might have been expected from her at that time when women weren't ex showing up and coaching basketball because the f fathers of other kids weren't coaching my intramural grade school basketball. My mother coached us. Funny story, my mother knew nothing about basketball, <laughs> but she had a whistle. <laughs> And a, and, a, and a sweatsuit, <laughs> like a gray flannel, or whatever those old sweatshirts were. It didn't have any, like, wasn't like cool, like Nike or anything. I was just like a gray sweatshirt, old champion or something, which is very posh now. Uh, but my mother knew how to blow that whistle. And although we had no skills and drills, my mother would blow the whistle. We'd run from one end of the court to the other end and one end of the other court. We were the fastest unskilled basketball team in our league. <laughs> We could get to the ball in the basket, we just didn't know what to do with it. So you have, for instance, a teacher or a coach who is, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna use the word, indoctrinated your, your, your child, and you're frustrated about it, and in this scenario, in the interest of the spirit of conversation peace, how would you coach a parent to approach that teacher or that coach to begin a dialogue that's productive rather than combative. Well, look, that's a great. Here's the here's the great classic uh, story that my mother used to tell. When she started teaching public school in the early 19 mid 1950s, my mother would describe it. And I know this is a generalization and a cliche, and it's just illustrative. But my mother would describe a, a, a well dressed couple, or nicely dressed. They put on nice clothes, and they'd come to school the first day when she was at that time teaching kindergarten before she'd gone to first grade. And they'd say, Mrs. Pennington, this is little Johnny, and thank you very much for t t being his first teacher here in kindergarten. Johnny, give Mrs. Pennington an apple or some, some gestural gift. And they would do that. This is how my mother described it. And they'd say, if, if Johnny gives you any problems, you let us know. And if there are any homework assigned to of course, kindergarten doesn't have much homework. But if Johnny gives you any problems, you let us know, and we will make sure that Johnny is well behaved in your classroom. We want to be proud of Johnny, and we're happy that he could be in your classroom. So that was the story she would tell. By the time she had finished, this is, this is toward the end of her 40 year career, she'd say typically, this again, I'm generalizing, she'd say one person of indistinct relationship to a child, barely dressed beyond their pajamas, would saunter to the school, not really come into this classroom and introduce themselves, but kind of nudge Johnny in the room and say, lady, you so much as touch this kid, I'll sue you. Now, that is a generalization, that's not true of everybody, obviously, but the tenor and temperament of much, or some, shall we say, let's not get carried away here, but that was the feeling as an educator who was de dedicated, to, that she got that there was, a, there was less trust, there was less respect, there was less understanding, the social contract between teachers and parents and the students had diminished to a point where it was adversarial and contentious. So it sounds like validation is key in the initial approach. So to what degree do we need to, to look for ways to validate the person that we want to have a conversation with as early as possible? Well, look, you have to, everything starts with some modicum of trust, right? You go to a teacher, you have to assume they have your child's goodwill at heart. We have to make assumptions about people, otherwise we go around in, in paranoia and distrust and defensiveness and everybody's a threat. And that's, that, that's not without a certain amount of reason. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's a sense in which, I'll go back to the idea of a social contract. What do we expect from one another in society? When you meet people and go up to them, 
you know, what do you reasonably expect? I mean, is, is this Mad Max, is this Thunderdome? Is this some post-apocalyptic world that we're headed toward? And on what basis or what grounds do we believe that we have any authority, right of expectation to deal with other, one another civilly? On what basis? Who, I don't, you know, we'll get to this, we'll have Q&A after it. Write your questions down, let's not miss it. But uh, validating someone is a great question. I validate them. I, you're validating people on the assumption that they, they mean you no harm. I mean, that's the general expectation of any civil society. Otherwise, we're wearing body armor, we're, 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 you know, we're armed, we're fearful, and you don't expect anything. You, you, you know, when, when, when you say, hail fellow well met, you hold your hand up, essentially. This goes back to the Romans, or this goes back to an earlier time than even the medieval era. And it's basically, and you're saying hi, you're basically saying, I mean, you know, I, I carry, bear no ill will or I have no threat or weapon. I mean, that's the, that's the implied gestural significance of just wave, hey, hi, I'm not here to kill you. But, you know, we, there is so much distrust in a society that does not have a shared basis of civility. I mean, you could say that. I might be getting too far ahead of myself here, but I mean, that's why we're, that's why we're here to talk, right? I, my hope for these conversation piece, love this. My hope for this whole series is this goes beyond Flint and that we actually in, invoke the idea that it, 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 there's an implied civic duty to civil and co even cordial discourse so we get our ideas out and not end up in screaming matches and shouting each other down or saying, I mean, when, when people in the news media and so on and others are saying people are Nazis, what are, they, are they completely blind to history? They have no concept of what a, a Nazi really means. It's just an easy way to dismiss people and, and label them. We gotta get, we, come on, grow up. You not you, me. not you. <laughs> you specifically. <laughs> I'm looking at you as I say that. Shawnee, I wanna be yeah. like you yeah. when I grow up. <laughs> so you touched on something that is a buzzword for me in my inner work and the work of my company at Soul Foundry, fear. The mistrust that inherently exists between two people, I believe is so often born of fear. Maybe it's a fear that you're gonna do me wrong. It's a fear you're gonna harm me in some way. It's a fear that you're a bad teacher and you're gonna hurt my kids, so I have to assert myself against this scenario before it even happens. That's fear. Fear is a storyteller. It works in uh, casting future predictions that, that are often extraordinarily vivid, so vivid that we believe they're going to happen. So how do we begin to dissolve fear in interactions? Hmm. Well, look, I don't think this happens easily because we carry inner fears, right? What, what your circumstances in life have everything to do with your action people. You, you are, if you grow up in Syria in a, in a conflict zone or any number of places in the world today in a conflict zone, you are going to have, I think, a justifiably objectivized, genuine and realistic and probably necessary level of fear or distrust about people. Or maybe you grew up in a section of Flint or any place. You don't have to go halfway around the world. If you've grown up, fear of your own parents is probably the most debilitating. So if you have been injured by a parent where you should be in an environment of nurture and trust, then things have gone bad from a very early stage in life. And what do we do there? We have to make accommodation for people's struggles because you, you don't know what somebody's going through when you meet them. You have gotta have a little grace, or a lot of grace, just to meet someone and say, I don't know what you've been through, but greetings, my fellow human being. I hope I can give or receive something generously, something humane and hopeful from you. So what, what does that look like? So eradicating fear is not only um, unnecessary, I think it's, health, it's unhealthy. Uh, but, but walking around dominated by fear, and here's what I mean, Grimm's fairy tales were originally designed to help children realize there is evil in the world. It would be absurdist to suggest to people today there's no evil in the world. There's always been good and evil in the world, but what we haven't done is adequately prepare people with a, a, a level of critical discernment and differentiation to know fight or flight. There's some instinctive mechanisms that, you know, that made us, make us feel a little uneasy. You know, you go into a store and you want to buy a, you know, a beverage, let's say, you're going to buy a soda, 
and, and someone's brandishing a, a large knife in one hand and an AK-47 in the other, you, you might think this is an unusual transactional environment. And uh, so it's not irrational. Look, you can use a number of examples, but I'm just saying that you know, tr trust has to be earned. We offer it when we meet new people, right? Generally, you offer, you offer your hand in friendship. You offer, you, you offer yourself in a certain humility or vulnerability, but that's how civilized societies generally work. If we don't trust anybody, or if you've been hurt over and over again, you're gonna see that in people. I know people that have grown up in some pretty rough circumstances, and so do you. And you gotta give them a little grace and say, I don't, I don't know what it was like. I know what it, how it hurt me not to have my dad, and I love my dad. My dad's 93 years old, and I love my dad. I've grown to lo really love him, but he left my mother and I when I was two. I saw him one afternoon when I was four, and I never saw him again until I was in college. Is he a bad person? Is he, look, the, he's my dad, and I have a relationship with him, and I love him, and I've learned so much from him. So, I love these questions. <laughs> we could go on and on. I'm not trying to, and by the way, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not trying to sound like I know. These are just, these are my impressions as I'm traveling through the world. That, that, that we, tr tr again, trust is earned. You offer it to people. If they betray you or hurt you, then you kind of back off, right? You don't want to be hurt more. And some of us have a more re instinctive recoil mechanism than others. Tr betrayal hurts. I would love to talk about some of your travels. So you've been to 55 countries. 56. Do, 56 to do... Cuba. Viva la Cuba. There we go. 56 countries to do work. Can you recall any stories from your travels where you've seen things work to create dialogue born of trust, a dialogue that dissolves fear between people that we can learn from in America that might look unconventional to us here. Oh yeah, listen, apartheid, South Africa, uh, the Rwandan massacre. I mean, you go to countries where the people have slaughtered each other over in just insanity, racism. Can I say something about racism? It's everywhere. What are you kidding me? Ending racism? You're gonna to have to end something a lot deeper than racism. You know where I've seen the worst racism? Let me just say this right here in Flint, Michigan amongst my brothers and sisters. The worst racism I've ever seen is in Africa, between African tribes, not African American, Africans and African. You wanna see hatred, mistrust, and racism? Go to Africa, bro. You think it was invented here? Racism's a terrible thing, wherever it is. You wanna see more racism? Go to Asia. You wanna see Asian racism? The, the, the Chinese hate the Japanese. The North Koreans don't trust the South Koreans. The Vietnamese don't like the Laotians. The Laotians don't trust the Thai. Go up and down, in and out. You wanna see the Caucasus? You wanna see tribal, tribal conflict? You wanna go in the Middle East? You wanna see racism there? Tribe on tribe. Come on, we have this utterly naive, racism's terrible, but it is not unique to the United States and Jim Crow and slavery. Racism, for goodness sake, it's a universal malady. And we've gotta go a little deeper than thinking this is just something we can overcome because it's been politicized, and it has, and it's everywhere. Well, talk about that for a second. What, what do you think, and if we can name it, I would love to, what's the deeper evil underneath racism? Ha, huh. well, I'm not a psychologist nor a theologian, but I would submit to you that the, real, the deeper problem for all of us is we're all broken. Now here's the ideological concern. What is the source of our brokenness? Hmm? And we're coming from different, our public schools, our families, our circumstances, our traditions are teaching us different assumptions about our brokenness. First of all, little Johnny or Susie, whoever, some children are raised and say, you can do no wrong. Anything that comes against you is someone else's fault. Johnny, you're wonderful, you're God's gift to the world, and what a wonderful child. You know, this is a kind of a rational narcissism in the parents, right? <laughs> Right? I mean, let's be honest. Uh, the flip side of that is you can do no good. Johnny, I, I regret that we ever had your mother and father. We never wanted you. You're, you're a miserable burden to us. Uh, I wish you'd die. You'll never do anything right. So what bizarre competing narratives go on in people's minds? You can do no wrong. Therefore, everything that happens to you is someone else's fault. You're victimized. Or you can do no right. And everything that happens to you is your own fault. You're no good. 
Is it programming from a very young age? Absolutely. That's based in maybe fear? Absolutely. And it's nature and nurture. Part of this is what the, the environment we live in, but part of it is nature that can overcome. There's story after story after story after story who people can, have overcome the worst circumstances in life. How they do it is a miraculous indication of human courage and hope and being able to overcome terrible things. But, you know, there, there you go. Which narrative do you choose? We're living with narratives that fight in our own heads. And the person that's mature, that grows up, grows through it, survives it, is the person who finally can step. This is why this question earlier about self-awareness and emotional intelligence is so important. We're locked in our own stories sometimes. Who or what will liberate us? That's one of the questions I wanted to ask you. I think narrative is so important. And we begin writing a narrative about ourselves. The stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves happen so early in our childhood through that programming. And I wanted to talk about the media's role in supporting the narrative that we buy into. And this is your area of expertise. So much of what we see in media is narrative. What are some ways we can dissolve negative narratives and write positive new narratives? And, and to what degree must, must this begin individually? Oh, this is, that's a fascinating and timely question, obviously. So number one, what is the media? What's the definition of media? Okay, stop, it's too many. Uh, media is something that is, goes between, right? You're an artist. What medium do you work in, huh? Between you and what is it you're producing? A media is a go-between. Hmm? So the media is a go-between between what? Experience as interpreted by journalists, reporters, and others. Interpreted. Key word. You have an experience. Four people could be standing on an intersection right outside this building and witness an automobile accident, a collision between two or three vehicles, yeah? So each one, when interviewed afterward by law enforcement or whoever's gonna do an accident report, will remember different portions of what they saw. I was here and I noticed this. I was at another corner, I noticed that. They're gonna have four different accounts. Now this is gonna be based on a number of assumptions. I was in uh, London year before last at the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum, and there was a, dis a whole a beautiful exhibition on human consciousness and the brain and human development. Fascinating. And they had a video. And isn't it interesting that you were tested on the video, you saw basically a crime scene. And it went so quickly, and then afterward, you were asked questions on the basis of what you'd just seen. Well, you think you noticed everything. Where did the person carrying the knife come from? Where was the woman with the purse? It was someone stealing a purse. What color was the car? What color was her purse? What color was the man? What color was the woman? What were they wearing? All these questions. You think you know, but if you don't, you tend to rely on something consciously or subconscious that may or may not be accurate. What's the application here? Journalists, are, they're human beings and they are interpreters. And the skill or lack of skill to which they interpret things has, almost, has a lot to do with their ability to report things. Fact meaning, fact meaning. There's a big gap between that. This is a fact, but what does it mean? Who is driving? What was their intent? Was it malevolent or is it accidental, etc.? So there's that condition, right? The second part of media is the fact that even if I do my job accurately and report something with, with as much objectivity as I can bring to it, I still have presuppositions. Everybody does. So I think when somebody's driving that fast, they must be out of control. Somebody else might think, well, they were escaping another danger that I wasn't aware of. It, many, many interpretations. Now, there's that level. Fact, meaning, translation, the interpretation. Now let's go to another level entirely. Who owns the media? Hello, who owns the media? Who's the go-between? Corporations that are in the news business. It's a business. Now I'd like to report to you, today in Flint, Michigan, people sat in a conversation and they listened to each other with, with kindness and intent and they understood each other. They tried to put aside their assumptions and presuppositions and prejudices and ideas and really listen to each other on a heart level with compassion and objectivity. That's today's news. Tune in tomorrow for the resolution of conflict and new people doing new things with newly innovative ideas. Footage at 11. Okay, wouldn't that be amazing? Instead, 
I am looking for conflict, and in fact, I will create conflict if I need to because it's a better headline. It's ratings, they're competing. The more incendiary, the more inflammatory, the more controversial, the more, the more, the more decadent, the more disastrous, the better the ratings. Let me tell you what's going on in the media. Wake up, you're being totally manipulated. And we act as though these are reliable sources and we, should, we can't question this because what we do is we tend to calibrate our affections and our liking according to our assumptions. I believe that white people are up to no good. All oh, those Asians, Native Americans, use, use the racial filter. Use any filter you want. I believe kids are, millennials are up to no good. I just feel it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I believe that people from, from Akron, Ohio are conspiring to take over Michigan, or Columbus, Ohio. I know it. I know it in my heart. Those Buckeyes. And that's true. And that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but you understand, these, these, this, this sounds, uh, superficially it sounds amusing on a certain level, but the fact is we operate with all kinds of sets and grids of prejudice. They're reinforced by how healthy or unhealthy our upbringings were and our, our basically our philosophic, ethical, and other education systems are. So here's my point about the media. You, you, you have to have a certain desire for facticity and looking beyond the surface to really get to anything in the truth, even if, and especially if you're a journalist. I know, look, I'm not a journalist. I know something about this. My mother's first cousin won the Pulitzer Prize for journalism, was the head of the Associated Press for Europe. I spent a lot of time with them and at the AP and so on. I know a lot of television presenters who made millions of dollars uh, in, in, at NBC and ABC and CBS. I, I've had friends that were producers. I've had friends that were, were, were journalists and reporters. And what I know from them, but just as friends, is they're people. They're, they're generally really decent people. But the producers, the editors, the publishers are going to have the last word. And if your story isn't something that's going to sell a paper, get audience share, create revenue, that story is subject to extraordinary levels of manipulation. And we have got to stop just acting like cat and fodder and be so naive that we believe everything. I don't care what your favorite news source is. These are human beings. And in many cases, they're being, shall we say, um, agitated or their news is being mitigated by other considerations that are ultimately financial. You get it? Save your questions. When I look at narrative. I see that a narrative is more powerful if there is more sentimentality attached to it. If it, if it moves me, then it's that much more true. So the emotions overtake the facts. And I want to talk a little bit about Flint. So it's, it's a bit more macro than, than the human heart, but if there is currency, in perception, if there's currency in the emotional entanglement with a narrative, how would you suggest that we adjust the exchange rate for a town with bad PR? The headlines about Flint are atrocious. And so much of that, I believe, is emotional. People who are outside of Flint see the headlines about Flint and believe them because there is so much gravity around tragedy. And it's all emotional. So how do we adjust the exchange rate from negative currency to positive currency? Right, great question. Any exchange rate is going to be based on real and perceived value, right? I give you uh, a, a thousand pesetas from, from uh, where do they use pesetas now? Pesos from Mexico. I paid for my first foster coffee with 20 pesos. It was probably worth like a buck 50. I don't know. I got a good deal. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, John. Um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, but there's, there's real, uh, something that has a lot of zeros on it, it's usually from an economy that's been in some kind of free fall. It's worth relatively little. It's like, you know, how many, 10,000 lira, you know, might get you a, like not even a loaf of bread in Italy. But a, a dollar, again, as a currency exchange, it's again perceived or real va value is only as real as what the bearer brings to the person who's receiving that and who's backing it. So let me translate that into in, in some kind of plain English, which is the currency of truth is in our culture so diminished to this point, we will pay more for a screaming headline than we will for a thoughtfully produced piece 
that challenges our assumptions but leads us closer to a real estimation of what's happened in our circumstances. Flint has been victimized by all kinds of sources. I'm not here to point fingers and say who's at fault. You guys have been through this over and over and over. Rinse and repeat. What you really have to do is it's got to start with small pieces of a community taking responsibility for their own determination and their own directives and their own destiny, saying we're not going to wait for someone to fix us. We're going to do whatever we can. It's like a pie, slice a piece off of Flint and make it work. And I see that happening right here at Ferrisville. You see that right here with people of goodwill and good conscience. We may have different opinions. Let's, let, let's, let's interact with each other afterward. We shouldn't be afraid of each other. We shouldn't be prepared to, for the, to have the animus of hatred because we've been agitated and manipulated. But the media is manipulating us. It's profitable. Manipulation is profitable. Figure that out. Collaboration and cooperation, innovation is a lot more costly to us. But it's gonna, in, the, in the end, it's going to net more fruitful outcomes. By the way, where are all those politicians that came through town a couple of years ago and they're running and say, this is an outrage, I'm here to fix it, and, and they're gone. Gone, gone, gone. You get it. But we got to start being people of self-determination. You have some amazing people in this city. You have amazing people who really care and are here and don't need to be bothered with this, but are doing it anyway. One of them sitting in this room. I'm not going to name him, but Phil Hagerman's here. <laughs> and uh, I love Phil. He's my new, but Phil called me and said, I think you're my new best friend, Phil. <laughs> Ditto. But Phil, here's a guy who does not, cover your ears, Phil. I'm going to talk about it for a minute, but here's a guy who does not need to be bothered with this. Phil's done so much with his dad and his life and industry, and he could go on to happier green pastures, but he's down here all the time because he cares. This guy, like, finds himself weeping over stuff. He cares. I get that. I do the same thing. I got, and you said it earlier. It's sentimentality. Well, what is that? What makes us care? Anyway, I'm not trying to lift, fill up like a superhero or something. Here's a guy that cares and he could be doing other stuff. And there are a lot of people that care. You care. You took enough time to come here tonight. So I applaud you. I'm glad to be here. And, you know, we could go on. These, these are things that really matter to me. I'm not here just to talk. Uh, I'm here to converse and have a conversation that leads us. To, I want to listen to you, too. And so uh, these are great questions, by the way. Well, I've, I've got one last question. And I want to, I want to call out uh, somebody who's here, a friend of mine, actually actually doing some of the work that you're, that you're touching on. Uh, how do we change course away from arguing with people who have poor perceptions of a community and start setting an example that inspires them? And I want to call out my friend Shawnee Neubecker. She, she just won. Um, uh, the, the, Flint, the Flint Soup event, and she has this project called the True Heart Project. And I don't want to speak for her, but her heart's broken for Flint. And what she's doing is piecing it back together by helping people rebuild trust. She does a lot of video content, and she tells the stories of people building trust, people connecting with the heart of the city by connecting with each other. So. Let's say somebody comes to you, maybe, maybe books you for a consultation, sits down with you and says, I'm a creative. I want to do what you said at Conversation Piece. I want to slice my pie. Where do I start? Because I want to do something that inspires people to have a different discourse rather than just continue to argue. Great. Well, look, everything starts. I'm going to go back to this because it's a theme that's heavy on my heart and I think is a liberating theme. Self-awareness. Where do you start? What, how aware are you of your potential? Geez, I could just do this, except the, the system's keeping me down. It's the man. It's this, and, and these are true things. I mean, there is, a, there is a kind of establishment that can be based on oppression rather than, than, than opportunism. Uh, these, these are realities. Think, it's not a fair or just or, 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 or entirely good. It's a, it's a beautiful but broken world. You can see the beauty. Jan and I were just driving over from Wasser. We were like, look at the beauty, just two miles away from here, beautiful fields and for uh, really forests. I mean, trees get together. It's, 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 there's beauty around Flint. And then there's brokenness too. Let's not be Pollyanna and wish it would just go away or that our circumstances are perfect. Nobody's circumstances are perfect. Start with that. And I've been privileged to be around some of the poorest people in the world. Privileged, I say that honestly. Like in Mozambique, I've been with people who live on 90 cents a day, adjusted, gross, net, daily income. How do you live on that? I've watched people who, there were, where the ratio of doc, physicians to people, citizens in the country is about one doctor to 1.2 million people. 
you will probably never see a doctor or a dentist in your life. I've actually seen people die from tooth decay because they got an infection that went into their bloodstream and they died. And I've seen how they die with dignity, they walk under a banyan tree, they sit alone, they reflect on life, and they die. And then I've watched people go as far as they can to see a physician or get any help at all. I mean, I've seen it all. And then I've seen, geez, I, I've seen, I, I don't know how this ended up. I'm, a, I'm just a kid from Owasso, Michigan, but I've been with the richest people in the world. I mean like the top 40 of the Forbes 400. And I've been on their jets and yachts and all this stuff. And guess what? They're just like the rest of us. They're lonely, they're afraid, they're mortal, they're gonna die someday. How will they be remembered? How will they face whatever you believe about the afterlife and judgment? I've got a whole story that I'd love to share that with you some other time, tell you my journey, how I've been sober from high functioning alcoholism, recreational cocaine use that led to merely recreational crack cocaine. But I've been, yeah, <laughs> with really cool people too, uh, <laughs> I thought. Uh, <laughs> It's always good to get, yeah, it's always good to kill yourself around cool people in great circumstances. No, it's not. I'm so, I'm so devastated with Anthony Bourdain and all this stuff, but look, I've been sober for 20 years this year, and I, I, I praise God. I praise my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm one of those God. Yeah, give it up. But that's, uh, you know, that's just part of the journey, man. Life's a lot better on the sober side, I can tell you that. But we tell ourselves things. When I was just out of my mind, I was telling myself, hey, you know, I'm having a cool journey. But I wasn't. So, end of the day, um, where does that leave us in terms of how, how we go through, how do we go through change? What, how, how do we change a place like Flint or any place, any place? You have to have an in, inviolable, fierce belief in something bigger, than, not just yourself. It's partly yourself, but it's a faith. It's not, put, think about where you put, you could put your faith in a lot of places and a lot of things, but your faith re, is reposited somewhere tonight. I'm gonna show them. Vengeance could be a place where you actually put your faith. What a misplaced faith, in my estimation. You could put your faith in all kinds of things, the political system, somebody, somebody somewhere, something. But I think ultimately, faith is a question of transcendence, ultimate concerns, ultimate values, and for me, it was just going back to the faith of my childhood, my youth, which I ignored. I thought, what has God got to do with my daily life? You know, really, what does God know about? I mean, I'd hear the Bible read in some Elizabethan English, and I thought, what's, I mean, that's beautiful. It's sort of kind of a beautiful sort of, you know, poetry. But what has that got to do with the real struggles I have? Misunderstanding, bullying, feeling left out, a hundred other things. So I, I didn't get there the easy way. I got there through the influence of an atheist at Oxford University named C.S. Lewis. <laughs> C.S. Lewis was influenced by a guy named John Ronald Rule Tolkien, the guy who wrote Lord of the Rings, a, two brilliant professors at Oxford who'd have these conversations on a place called Addison's Walk on the Sherwell River behind Magdalen College at Oxford. Spent a lot of time there. And finally, Lewis wakes up from his, he's, he's, he's brilliant, and he's an atheist, and he wakes up one day and says, through a, a series of influences, he comes to around to his faith. So, I'm not, I'm not here to argue faith positions, but just to tell you subjectively, in my own journey, it's, it's meant everything to me. <laughs> and I get, oh, everything, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be sober, I wouldn't even care about you guys, or your pro good, good luck with your problems. But something's making me more human, I'm still on that journey, I don't think I'm fully human yet, really, if you think about it. There's only been one, arguably, historically, human being who's walked on the earth, one this crazy carpenter kid who was rejected, misunderstood. Either this guy is, as Lewis said, the greatest liar that ever lived. You'd be insane to follow him. He was a lunatic. You'd feel sorry for him. Or he is the Lord. And life is too short to ignore anybody with those truth claims. As I can tell you right here, right now, not Zoroaster, not Mohammed, not Gautama Buddha, not um, Confucius, Nobody has even made the claims that Jesus of Nazareth made. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It, it said, I mean, he put it all on the cross. Now, this is all ludicrous, and I'm willing to accept that argument too. Or there's something in it that's so powerful that even our churches and religious institutions haven't fully grasped or expressed it. At least they didn't to me. That's why I didn't embrace it so early. But that's another story. You guys have been so patient to listen to me and... I hope you don't think I'm a complete lunatic. I have run people ragged by repeating the phrase over and over and over, know your worth, know your worth. Yeah. 
know your worth, know your worth. So when you, when you coach a creative who's beginning their journey toward elevating their dialogue, toward inspiring others in their city, you say begin with self-awareness. Begin with essentially knowing your worth. And I, I think the question of the day is what informs your worth? Now that might be different for everyone. You know, we, we, we know what it is for Gordon. and I, I have a, sim a similar place that I come from. What informs your worth? What's your base of operations? Because that informs your perspective. That informs how you see other people, the world around you, your community, and how you see things. That perception is how you engage it. That's the narrative that you tell yourselves. And when you adjust it, and you, you have this clearer prism that you see things through, you see your worth, you see what you have to offer. Through self-awareness, you know that gift that you have, and then you're empowered to share it through empathy, through compassion. So Gordon, that's a beautiful punctuation. Thank you so much. Um, I, I would love to open the floor, we've got about 20 minutes left, to some questions that you have. So we have a microphone right over here on the side of the room. If you would, uh, raise your hand and we'll just we'll have you uh, have you come up to ask your questions or if you have a comment if you'd like to share something please please feel free don't storm the mic please there's only so much time cool well, i'm glad we answered your questions jacob hi gordon um jacob yeah, I'm uh, hey, one of those evil members of the press so you're gonna have to <laughs> apologize for me trying to manipulate um, I thought you made some really good... I don't mean to make an inherent assumption there. I think your, your job is made uh, more difficult by producers and editors. I, I had like three questions, but I'm going to try and actually only ask one. Um, you made a distinction through corporate media, media being the medium. Um, do you believe that the fourth estate can still proffer a discussion? Because it sounded like interpretation from the corporate press and the distinction being constitutional, press, media. What are we losing in the public debate? Because it seems like you have a value there that is a little understated, and I'd be curious of your thoughts on that. Wow, great question. Everybody understand the four estates. The fourth estate is a French concept of the ruling elite, the priestly class, the, 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 um, the moneyed, um, the po political class, and the fourth estate is essentially the press to report on what's happening in the other three estates. So that's the reference to the fourth estate. And, uh, and the idea is that they're unsullied by other influences and they can report without, in, without, um, uh, without interference. And I don't think it's true anymore. In, with, with, you're the exception here, Jacob, but obviously medium and news is a product it's in a competitive field. It's a profit, for-profit product, okay? Even NPR staff gets paid. Uh, so let's just start with that one. News is a product. Is it possible for us to get news um, objectively? Well, look, I don't know you, but I suspect that you, you do your best. I'm, I'm making an assumption that I began with earlier, which is trust. I'm assuming you're a reasonable person and you're trying to do your job and do it with excellence and, and again, those are unproven assumptions and I'm extending my trust to you as a fellow human being on the journey you seem reasonable to me at, at, at first look. But on and on, when you report something, if Gordon Pennington uh, you know, you know, got a torch out and burned something here, said, vehicle city sucks, vehicles suck, you're polluting the world, and I burn that, and somebody photographs that, and said, it's probably gonna be more newsworthy than saying, let's collaborate together no matter what our politics whatever our background, let's listen to each other first and figure out what we have in common and then try to come up with solutions. Sure, there'll be some negotiation. And sure, we'll have to you know, make some modifications at some level, perhaps. But isn't that better than just name calling and storming out of rooms and, and escaping to our quote unquote? What's safe about a safe space? It's, 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 it's absurdist. It's running away it's, instead of like, let's deal with each other because we're ultimately all mortal, all human beings, we're on a shared mystical journey, or, 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 life is nothing but time plus chance plus matter. So you, please, if you're an existentialist here, raise your hand and tell me what does it matter. Good luck assigning heroic value to your journey. Have fun with that. 
But if you are a transcendist, if you, tr you have a transcendent sense, transcendent sense that your life has value and meaning beyond this world, which is an assignment from a creator who's good and loving and has given us free will to screw up or get it right, and every day is another set of exercising that set of judgments, then, um, then a lot of that complicity and responsibility falls back on us. It's not like, darn, you know, fist shaking at the divine. It's more like, what am I, again, I'm going back to self-awareness, emotional intelligence, and what that looks like transactionally in this life. Jacob, that's a great question. I'm afraid I haven't even adequately answered it, but I'd love to talk to you. I would like to hear the other two, frankly, if you care to, yeah. <laughs> to ask them. Sure. I thought that was but really... this, this, this lovely lady is waiting patiently. Oh, oh please, please come, yeah, yeah. Hi, my name's Camila Bashir. I, I am a lowly social servant, AKA a nurse. Um, I don't have a big, huge philosophical anything, but I do want to know your take on the social service agencies in this country and what you think can be done to modify them to fit what our society needs now. Because I think that has a lot to do with with um, the self-awareness that's lacking, the community that's lacking. Um, just throwing that out there. We'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Well, look, let's start with the fact that we need each other. We're better together. None of us has all the answers, all the skills, all the understanding, all the resources, all the education, all the awareness. So we need, let's start with we need each other. I'm hardly an expert at this, so I can't tell you, like, here's my estimation of all the social services and systems in America. But I would guess that they, they, what, what start, my grandmother was the first woman in her family to receive an undergraduate degree at Oberlin College. How many know Oberlin College? Yeah, good, because you probably heard me talk about it. Oberlin College was the first college to admit women and the first college to admit Negroes. That's, what they, that's how they were referred to, that's how the black community preferred to be referred to at Oberlin College. Okay, sorry if I'm not politically correct, but I, you know, that's what it was. And the beauty of that was it was co-educational, it was multiracial, and the, and the, the uh, motto of Oberlin College to this day is labor and learning. You worked on a farm that was owned by the college to work off your, your tuition. That, anyway, that's where my grandmother went to school. First member of her, uh, her English German family, and her father and mother could not marry in Ohio where they lived because it was looked down upon to, to marry interculturally. The Germans spoke, German farmers spoke German, the English spoke, can, picture that. So they had to get on the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad, come up to Detroit, Flint, end up in Owasso, where they were accepted. There was a greater level of intercultural, international marriage, <laughs> right? So anyway, that was pretty good. Then she went on to the University of Michigan, received in 1923 a special degree for women, because who would need a master's degree if you're a woman, and became the first woman to direct social services for Detroit's Wayne County. So I know a little bit about her experiences in social services. They had great dignity. It's an extension of what historically you would say are part of our value set. This was, believe it or not, at one time, a basically, not entirely, but essentially, a, in, in the history of Western civilization, a Judeo-Christian culture and its ethics and values. That doesn't make it perfect. But my grandmother was motivated by her affection for people to help kids, and the stories I heard were myriad. And uh, so I believe we need social services if we can't take care of ourselves fully. I don't believe we just cast people to the wind and historically, communities were intact, families were intact, and churches were intact. Churches are a huge part of the African-American community's history, huge part of the, uh, of the uh, Anglo community, huge part of our multiple communities. And that brought a certain sense of collective reason and responsibility to what we did. Were they perfect? No, because, you know, churches attract sinners, <laughs> which is probably a good thing. But... <laughs> But I really believe that we need social services, and I'd love to talk to you more about that, because obviously, to, to estimate their value, sometimes it's wrong. Look at the VA. Someone was just telling, who was just telling me that, that they couldn't get a hold? Today, a veteran told me he's had nothing but misery with the Veterans Administration, and last week, for the first time in his life, he got an immediate call. So, we need these services, and there are all kinds of them. And I, re and I salute you for being a nurse. We need more nurses, because, it, what a compassionate uh, calling, and uh, 
And thanks for stepping up. We'll talk more. Maybe coffee. No problem. Better. Please, more questions. Now I know why Ashley invited me here. <laughs> What's your name? Rebecca Johns. Hi, Rebecca. How you doing? Good. Um, I had no idea what I was walking into tonight, so thank you for that. What are you on? Um, you're kind of speaking to my whole life mission and purpose. Wow. I am a holistic health practitioner. I'm a minister. Um, I'm a mom to four stepchildren and two biological. I was molested in my childhood, raped in my 20s by an acquaintance. I've been through a divorce. I've been through an almost divorce. I've experienced the fruits of great financial prosperity, and I've been homeless. Born and raised here in Flint, but to immigrants, people who came to America because where they were was unsafe to be called home anymore. And they came here for the dream. I ask myself a lot, why does stuff happen? Why? What's it for? I've worked nationally, I've worked internationally in my professional life. Oddly enough, in the 90s, I was a stand-up comic, so I've seen 38 states of America using humor to try to survive the pain. And given this is a conversation for creatives, we do a lot to mask the pain, explain the pain, justify the pain, access a reason for why we can just say thank you for the pain. It'll go away <laughs> if we go, great, thanks, good job, you did your job, get the hell out, let me move on. And I was on the way here, Camila and I came together, I called her like, hey, Ashley said I should be this place and my presence would make a difference, I don't know why, but I'm compelled, do you hear me? Compelled to be there. And this is why, because in reconciling life in a way that I could have peace. Not so that you guys could have peace, not so that black people could have peace, not so that the persecuted Christians from back home for my father's sake could have peace. None of that. I couldn't effectively serve any of those people anyway because my brokenness was too great. And I couldn't be a bearer of peace until I had it. So there are things in your speaking that are so important that I want to say thank you for saying. They're gutsy. They're not politically correct. They tell the truth about where we've been and where we are, and my hope would be that people would hear these conversations for the sake of what the future could be. It hurts to say I was raped, but it hurts for somebody to say I raped her. <laughs> There's more than one broken person in a broken equation. And you said something really important, which is grace and mercy must prevail. We have to have grace and mercy in this life with each other. Um, peace cannot be fostered without healing. And you said something else really important, and that is blame doesn't matter. I could spend the whole rest of my life pointing fingers at why my uncles were so jacked up that molesting me sounded like a good idea from ages 2 to 11. What, what, why? I could spend the rest of my life insane about that, or I could grasp this one principle, hurt people, hurt people. It's not a frickin' bumper sticker. It's the real deal. 
and our access is not blame but responsibility. Look, I don't know what was up with my uncles, but here is what I know. I'm currently broken, <laughs> regardless of whose hands did it or whose strong spirit. Now, what can I do? What can I do? And I was just speaking to my son about this. I have a 23-year-old stepson who I've raised since he was nine years old, and he's had some real life awakenings in adulthood. And he's kind of resigned to the system. Ah, government, ah, the Secretary of State, ah, this, ah, IRS, ah. And he made a comment today that was kind of like a throwaway of our nation. And I hear it a lot from, you know, like we're all so sick and tired of how it is that we're almost abandoning our own ships. Like, this is our country still, you know? Don't let it fool you. Don't let anybody fool you. And I said to him, son, don't be so quick to throw this country away. <laughs> don't be so quick to throw out the baby with the bathwater. A nation is a collection of individuals. So if we have a broken nation, it's because we are a collection of broken individuals. You want to upgrade your collection of something? You want to upgrade that? Then make each piece better. If you collect stamps, get the best dang stamps. Preserve them, take care of them, keep them in mint condition. We haven't taken care of ourselves in this country, in our own families. We're hurt, we're broken. And so now we're a collection of that together. And it's so easy to just gnash at the teeth and be angry and blame, but all of that that I've said is to say, I hear you, I see you, I appreciate you, but for those of us that now sit in a town in like Flint and call it home, what would you say, given your sight of the whole world that you've seen, what would you say is the key thing that we can address, like take an action step towards to make the difference? You've seen a lot. Somebody's gonna say pray for it. Somebody else is gonna say throw money at it. Somebody else is gonna say go do a march. What would you say is the thing that we can get our hands around and start formulating a task force for and taking actions immediately to foster the healing that makes peace possible in individuals so that collectively we are families and neighborhoods and cities and states, therefore a nation that is well. I am so glad you were compelled to accept my invitation. Thank you so much, Rebecca. So, Gordon, what's next? Well, Rebecca, look, you've been very um, transparent, sharing a very painful part of your life's journey, and, and there's more to it, obviously. And we could probably go the whole around the, the, the temptation in a situation like this is something has been provoked and evoked in you to share this, and thank you. That takes a lot of courage. And I want to, someday in some place, there'll be a forum and context for us to get to know each other. We're, we're all broken. Nobody, nobody gets away without injury in, in this broken world. But to answer your question, and thank you for getting the question, which is, how do we make a difference? And I want to tell you for starters, Flint is so much further ahead than most of the struggling world. Let's not forget we've got enormous advantages here, even in our brokenness. Start with that. Then two stories came to mind before I was getting ready to speak here tonight, and I, I'm not sure why, but one was about a massive number of people who were stuck and facing the worst circumstances they could imagine. And the other story was a small group of people who were stuck in total darkness, wondering what their fate would be. Two groups of people, one in the light of day on a beautiful beach, and another group of people in total darkness. What shared characteristic they have. The first group is a third of a million soldiers facing certain destruction by a, the most formidable war machine the world has ever seen in a world war. And it's the soldiers on Dunkirk Beach. While the German war, the, the Luftwaffe and the Wehrmacht was surrounding them, it, it was certain destruction. And by some extraordinary twist of fate and providence and miracles, whatever you like to assign to it, Winston Churchill and his command had this idea that they should take fishermen, take everybody, and form a, a, a flotilla uh, to rescue them, an armada to rescue them. And it happened. The other group 
10 years ago were a group of 33 Peruvian miners facing almost certain death to the point where people on the surface waited a month. They, couldn't, they, couldn't, they didn't even know if they were alive. They had the faith to keep drilling, keep trying. Another month. Can you imagine three days in, 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 dark, in those circumstances? How about a month? How about two months? How about going on three months? You've got to go back and read these stories just to, just to be comprehensive. Whatever you want to sign, providence and, and extraordinary circumstances and change, Flynn is, here's my question to Flynn. Are you ready for your miracle? Because it will take something of, of all of us together, a faith, and you could say you're, maybe you're a humanist, maybe, maybe your assignment of virtue and values lies elsewhere. I'm not here to make judgments about your spirituality. I'm just saying, if we believe in, in each other as a starting point, we might believe in more. And I believe that the change is gonna happen when we get together like this. We're not trying to boil the ocean. Let's start with, carving a place of the pie up. I worked with Rudy Giuliani at one time when people in New York City would say, what's wrong with this darn city all the time? And Giuliani's reaction was, uh, what's wrong with your neighborhood? <laughs> we gotta start with some place. It might start with your home. Is there order and peace and love and hospitality in your home? How about, if, what have you lately done to love on your neighbors? Take them a cookie. I'm not kidding. Do you, do you know your neighbors? Literally. You start there and you begin. I don't think it's waving a magic wand, but it's starting somewhere and showing up strong. And, just, and this is another conversation. I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. We're almost out. I will, however, I, I promise you, I would come back here in a heartbeat and have this conversation formally or informally. Nick Pydix, my, my, my guy, um, uh, Phil, I mean, look, look at the generous people you have in this, and tons of people I don't know. A a Ashley, we met on lot, first we just met, we, and I'm just like, I love this, I love this man. I mean, like, you know, you just resonate with certain people. You got a room full of really, I suspect, really generous and caring and wonderful people. Flint, start here, just identify with what you, and your creatives, we haven't even discussed the creative process. Narrative wins, story wins. He who tells the best story, I don't care if you're an existentialist or a transcendentalist or a, 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 a revivalist. What, take all the great currencies of power and influence and transformation of the human's journey, and it's all driven by story. And you have been maligned. All the people think about is Flint, is Flint and dirty water. I talked to friends on the phone today. What, what do you associate with Flint? Dirty water, dirty water, you know, toxic water. It's like, really, that's all. You should see, and, and then Phil's telling me about all the extraordinary cultural assets that are accessible to people, and astronomy, uh, uh, is it the observatory or the? Yeah, I mean, guys. You have some extraordinary assets. I, I could go on and on because this stuff really excites me and, I, and I'll say it again if Nick or, or, or Just or whoever arranges this and all the people have hosted, I know there are other sponsors, I'm not recognizing you all properly, but, but thank you. This is the beginning. I yes, hope this will you. take place every month and, and, may, and maybe it has to take place even more frequently where we kind of identify the uniqueness of people's gifts and, connect, and the thing, Phil and I have been hosting some conversations with some folks in the state just to say, we're part of human ecosystems. Yes. Flint is not alone any more than one neighbor. The north side is not alone. We're all part of something bigger, and our state is part of something. We have just begun to listen to each other, get to know each other, and do something better together. So that's my heart, and you've been, you've been very courageous to kind of share your journey. I wish we had more time. Honestly, out of respect for the, the group. Thank you for your time. Please, Rebecca, thanks for coming. Please stay sure. as long as you would like and as long as the, the kind folks here at Fosters and 100K Ideas will allow us to stay. Learn a name, make a friend, make a decision about playing a role in your community and how we reshape the problem solving dialogue. Thank you so much to Jackie Burke and the Hub for your support. Thank you so much to Dan Walling, the Flint Social Business Forum, for your support. Thank you so much to, to Flint Michigan Films. Thank you for attending this conversation piece. Join us next month for another conversation piece featuring music mogul Brandon Corder. Thank you so much, Gordon Pennington, for sharing what you've shared with us. Good evening. <laughs>